The White Bear Area Chamber of Commerce and SCC TV are proud to present Your Business Matters, dedicated to your business needs. The White Bear Area Chamber is a nonprofit business organization serving as advocates to the White Bear Area and its business community. Now, here is the Executive Director of the White Bear Area Chamber and the host of Your Business Matters, Tom Snell. Welcome to Your Business Matters, brought to you by the White Bear Area Chamber of Commerce. Each month, we interview community leaders and local business owners so you can be informed about the developments in our community. I'm pleased to welcome Brian Baer, the City Manager for Hugo. Brian and I will discuss the implications of a lawsuit that focuses on sustaining the water level in White Bear Lake. Brian, thank you for uh, coming on to our program. And before we uh, get into a discussion about the lawsuit, uh, because it does relate directly to the use of water in our community, I wanted to get some information from you about what is Hugo doing presently uh, to conserve water uh, in our area? Well, first of all, thanks for inviting me. Tom. You're welcome. It, uh, this is an important topic for the city of Hugo. Our city council has taken water management very seriously. So our city is, is doing more than what we think just about any other city in this state is doing when it comes to good water management. Uh, the primary thing that makes the biggest difference for us in Hugo, in addition to all of the, mm -hmm. all of the typical water conservation measures, is that we reuse stormwater. So we disconnect our very largest water users in the city and we reconnect them to an alternate water supply, which in our case is stormwater. So instead of using water that we can otherwise drink from the ground, we use stormwater for things like irrigation. You know, it's interesting that, that um, I think I recently heard that, uh, that for every gallon of stormwater that we're able to keep in our area, we lose two gallons to Pig's Eye, which is the uh, treatment center uh, in the uh, Twin Cities area, but go on, it's interesting. Yeah, so stormwater and reusing it is smart for a number of different ways. It, uh, by keeping the water in the community, it prevents that water from going down the drain towards pig's eye, number right. one. But it also prevents it from running off into the Mississippi River or into our lakes. So if we can capture water and keep it on site, there's three things that happen, first of all, it improves water quality downstream. We trap and collect pollutants on site so they don't pollute our water bodies. Sure. Secondly, it helps us with flood control. If we keep the water upstream and don't let it go downstream, it helps with flood management. And then the third thing is that it helps protect our water supplies. And so the mm -hmm. water that should be in the ground and used for important things stays in the ground. Um, and we use storm water for things like irrigation. Could somebody uh, imply from that that the uh, because you're collecting the water, uh, ultimately it drifts down into the aquifer uh, because you're uh, because it's staying in in the area, so that uh, indirectly anyway uh, has a positive impact on White Bear Lake. Yeah, so that's a really intriguing question, right? Because um, one of the theories has been that groundwater and surface water are more interconnected than we thought before. So if... And surface water being... Surface water being lakes and ponds mm -hmm. and streams and okay. things like that. And so if, uh, if the theory is that if we pump water out of the ground and maybe that will impact a surface water body, then the reverse has also got to be true. So if we put water on the ground and let it soak in, then some of that water's got to get back into the aquifer. And so by putting water back into the ground, we're recharging our water supply. Mm -hmm. Okay, well that, that makes a lot of sense. So I want to get into now a little bit about the, uh, the lawsuit. And uh, part of the discussion I want to have is because Hugo is doing certain things, uh, maybe some of those issues can be replicated in other communities. And uh, would that actually have an impact on, on the lawsuit that we have? And we'll get into that discussion a, a little bit later. But let's lay the groundwork on the lawsuit. Exactly 
what is this lawsuit about? Okay, so that's a big question. Yes. And I'll just give you my perspective That's fine. In, in a nutshell. So the theory behind the lawsuit is that um, when big wa users of water, like a city, so right. each city has a municipal water supply and we supply waters, water to all of our residents and mm -hmm. businesses. And as we pump water for, those, for that purpose, we pump it out of the ground. The water that we pump is 300 to 350 feet deep. And the theory in the lawsuit is that as we pump water out of the ground, that that somehow sucks water out of the bottom of White Bear Lake. And that is the, the reason for the lawsuit. The lawsuit is uh, asking the DNR to... The, the DNR is the... The Department of Natural Resources. Okay, all right. So in the lawsuit, uh, a group of landowners has sued the DNR um, and uh, against their mismanagement of the resource. So okay. the idea is that the DNR has allowed cities and others to take water out of the ground, which then somehow sucks water out of the bottom okay. of the lake. Okay, gotcha. Okay. So uh, because of that, uh, there are certain implications that have um, uh, impacted various communities, right? And, uh, That's true. and Hugo being one of them. Now, I understand that the, that the area involved with the lawsuit is not just directly around White Bear Lake, but it expands into other uh, communities like Hugo. And uh, what, are, what are some of the, uh, how does the court ruling then impact uh, the, some of the residents and some of the businesses in Hugo? Okay, so the court order, the result of the lawsuit is that um, it does a number of things, and the first thing it does is it draws a line around White Bear Lake. Okay, and that would be the communities just right around the lake. So down. everything within five miles of the lake oh, five miles. Okay. is included within the realm of influence per this lawsuit. Some communities that are even farther away are going to also be impacted, but for discussion today, there's a five-mile limit around the lake, a kind of a magic line that's been drawn and those users of water within that five mile radius are impacted. Mm -hmm. Now what we know, the troubling part, is that the science doesn't back up a concentric radius around the lake. The latest science would, would indicate that the city of Hugo, for example, has an insignificant impact on, oh, it does. on the and, lake. And that comes from what? That comes from the DNR Okay. And uh, the other studies that have been done from the USGS and others have not made any scientific connection between water usage in the city of Hugo and the level of White Bear Lake. Okay, and before we get into the implications of the lawsuit, then if they haven't had any implications, then why is Hugo part of the, uh, the five-mile radius then? That's what we'd like to know. And so this <laughs> is a... Uh, yeah. Um, the lawsuit doesn't make very much sense. The judge's order doesn't make very much sense for most of us that are implicated. Mm -hmm. um, we know that if we were to stop using water completely, if we didn't let anybody drink the water or use the water in any way, it doesn't look like that would have any impact on the level of the lake. So the lawsuit and the resulting court order, in our view, is not going to succeed in filling the lake back up with water. This is not going to have that kind of result, particularly by impacting Hugo. Um, we do not seem to have the ability to put water in the lake or to take water out of the lake, no matter what we do. Mm -hmm. And so um, we're impacted. We have avoided trying to be involved. We have not intervened in the lawsuit. We are not a participant in the lawsuit. Okay, yes. But for some reason, we've been included by the judge's order. And there's no, uh, and, and as of right now, you don't know why that is, then? We can speculate, but no matter how you do that, it doesn't make sense. Okay. The, it is not backed up by any rational purpose that we can mm -hmm. see. Okay, then uh, real quickly, uh, in, in, in Hugo, does it, uh, it, it does impact both businesses and homeowners, correct? Yes, it does. Um, so... There are several things that happen with the lawsuit. First of all, the, the, the DNR, the Department of Natural right. Resources, is prohibited from 
allowing for the construction of new wells, the issuance of new permits to pull water out of the ground, or the expansion of existing permits. And that's really important by itself because if, if the city of Hugo wants to grow, or if any of the cities in the region would like to add new business or new neighborhoods or whatever, they're going to need water. And to start with, if it's, if it's difficult for a city to be able to get new water supplies out of the ground, and it's difficult mm -hmm. to support okay. business Great. growth and other growth. And, and we're, we'll continue, uh, this is a very interesting aspect of our conversation, we'll continue it. Uh, we're going to take just a real short break. Uh, and I have a couple of announcements that I would like to make about chamber uh, events that are taking place. On April 5th at Keller Golf Course, the Chamber will hold its annual meeting inaugural and registration starts at 11 a.m. with lunch and program scheduled from 12 to 1.30 p.m. Our featured speaker is Carl Rick and Carl Rick is the official spokesperson for Quick Trips and uh, visit the uh, Chamber website. Our hyperlink is www.whitebearchamber.com. Again, Brian Baer with the uh, city of uh, Hugo, the city manager. We were talking about uh, the implications of how this judge's lawsuit will impact the city of Hugo, and we were talking about the well issue. Uh, okay. Can we continue on that a little bit, Brian? Absolutely. So, uh, no new wells, for okay. example, no new appropriations, and no expansions of existing ones. Um, also in the, in the judge's order related to the lawsuit is are other things that will impact businesses and residents in, in yep. Hugo and in other surrounding areas. Um, for example, there's, a, there's requirements that the city adopt some regulations. One it has to do with irrigation bans and another one particularly for the business community that's very important is this, all of the cities need to start developing rules on how much water is used per person. Okay. And that is a, it doesn't sound like a per person water usage would impact a business, but it does in a very negative Great. way. Great, and I want to go into that in, in uh, one, one minute here. You mentioned earlier that the uh, that uh, without the, the, that there, the city is, gonna, there's a moratorium on new wells, is that correct? Uh, for expansion. That is for residents and others, right? So there is a there is a moratorium on wells that require an appropriations permit from the DNR. So that's, what, those what are, does that mean? Those are big wells. So if okay. somebody wants to use more than a million gallons of water a year or ten thousand gallons a day, they need to get a permit from the DNR to do that. Is that hard to get? It will be impossible to get um, following the judge's order. Okay. The so, other, go the, ahead. Well, in, interestingly, yeah. those who don't need to get a permit um, can use water to irrigate. Those who are connected to a city water supply are not going to be able to irrigate under the judge's order. What does that do to, uh, let's say that there's a business that wants to move into Hugo. Sure. I would imagine that that could have a, that that would be part of the thought process that a business would look at before they would come in. Uh, not only for Hugo, but for all of the communities that are impacted by this lawsuit. That it would have an impact on whether or not a business might want to, maybe they don't want to expand in the areas that are impacted by a lawsuit or maybe a new business would think about other areas where they wouldn't have these type of restrictions. Is that a, a fair assessment? Yeah, so maybe these are unintended consequences. We don't know, uh -huh. but, but it's, hard to, it's hard to guess. But if you're a business, and especially if you're a business that needs, if you're a manufacturer that needs processed water, yep. some industrial user, 
and you're deciding where you're going to locate your business or if you need to move because you need to expand, yeah. are you going to locate in the White Bear Lake area knowing that you may have difficulty getting getting approval or getting a connection to a water supply, uh -huh. you might, other areas might be more attractive to you. And so ec from an economic development standpoint, this is yes. a very bad thing to okay, have Okay, yeah, yeah, I can see that. Now you also mentioned uh, before I, we went on into this uh, tangent about uh, the expansion of businesses and the, the well use, about the um, amount of water that uh, people or individuals can use per day and how that might affect the business community. Can you expand on that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, so, so for very strange reasons that we don't understand, uh, there's been a requirement for cities to adopt a regulation about how much water each person can use per day. We average it over the whole city per, this, per the judge's order. Okay. And when we do that, there's certain winners and losers. Okay. And a winner would be somebody that doesn't use very much water per person per day. And, and a, an example of that would be an apartment project. They're going, not going to use very much water per person per day. Right. A single family resident will use more than an apartment resident. But the, the real losers here are businesses. Why would that be? Because if you're a business, nobody lives at the business. Right. And so when you regulate water per person and you don't add any people, you lose. And so as a city tries to figure out how to manage itself and how to keep under these new caps that are added, one way to do that would be to add more high density housing and to make sure that new business doesn't come into the community. That's a very bad idea, but that is a direct result uh -huh. of the lawsuit. If you think this all the way through to its conclusion, you come, you come away with the fact that you will use more water as a result of the lawsuit because you will encourage users like apartment complexes yeah versus things like businesses that might use less water or things like lower density residential. Sure. Now, uh, getting back again uh, to the uh, judge's order, I understand that her ruling is under appeal. And um, does that mean that these regulations have to stay in place while the court case uh, proceeds to its ultimate conclusion? So the DNR has asked the judge for a stay so that the provisions of the court order do not have to be enforced. We know that the, the case is going to be appealed, but so far the judge has not approved a stay. The and judge so, has to approve it, the one that originally uh, made the ruling has to approve the stay, huh? That's true. And so okay. Since the judge has not approved a stay, theoretically, the implementation of the court order needs to proceed. Do you have any idea how long this is going to take? <laughs> implementation of these measures is not easy. And yeah. uh, cities, to implement uh, irrigation bans and things like that, it's a very labor-intensive, costly thing to do. None of us well, have... it's costly, too. Well, sure. Yeah. Um, none of us have included resources in our budgets or uh, staff to be able to deal with the provisions that are in the court order. And so it is a mandate that's costly. It uh, normally, normally policy direction like this would come from a group of elected officials like a legislature or a city council. In this case, it's different. It's come from a court. Normally, you do not get policy direction from a court. Right, yeah. And that has happened in this case. And so it will take some time for cities to figure out how to do this, uh, but the cities are not being given much time okay. per the court order. Okay, so the, um, do you have any idea how long the process, again, might take before, I mean, through the court system? Is there any, uh, does anybody know? Uh, what, how long the appeal process might take? Is it years or months so or the, days? The, the district court has ruled. Yeah. The appeals process would be to the court, Minnesota Court of Appeals. Right. And that should, if things go well, that should be scheduled maybe in, in late summer, early fall for the okay. hearing. 
and then it takes some time after that for the for wow. the ruling to come. Um, there's also an appeal option after that, then of course to the state court of appeal, or I'm sorry, the state supreme court. Right. And so it could go on for a while yet through appeals. Okay. The other, uh, just real quickly, a couple of other questions that I wanted to address. Uh, I've heard that one of the options that's come out is uh, if we just move everybody over to surface water, this whole thing goes away. Uh, is that easy and is it expensive if, if all of a sudden Hugo had to go over to surface water or White Bear or whatever? Is it, is it something that could be done quickly uh, and cost effectively? Right, so thanks for that question. It is uh, another requirement of the court order that cities create plans for funding and for conversion to a surface water supply. We know that the only study that's been done in this case so far that includes Hugo is one that was authorized by the Metropolitan Council. And that study indicated that it would cost $623 million. Who's going to pay for that? To convert Hugo to a surface water supply. Um, that's a great question. <laughs> Nobody knows how that would happen. And it doesn't seem like it's even... Um, a good idea. Hugo does not have any impact on the lake, so why would we consider um, converting well, to a surface a lot water of money. supply? It's a lot of money. It's it seems like a lot of money being spent for nothing, and uh, yeah. it is not something that the city of Hugo, with our budgets, right now you're would not, be able you're to not contemplating doing that at the present moment. Absolutely not. Okay. No. And then the final question I have is that uh, the the lawsuit obviously was set to protect the lake level. Do you have any alternative um, ideas, real quickly, uh, about what maybe uh, should be done? Some things that can be done that would be able to get community support and consensus uh, to help uh, preserve White Bear Lake if there is a problem? You know, there have been a lot of ideas that, that have come forward to divert water in one way or another to White Bear Lake. Um, any water that's used to go into that lake needs to somehow be treated and cleaned right. um, so it doesn't affect the water quality. Um, we haven't thought too hard about that in Hugo. Um, um, it is not, uh, since we're not contributing to the problem, the lake is not in our city, and uh, we haven't spent a lot of time figuring out solutions to that. But we okay. do think there's some reasonable ideas out there that could be discussed Yeah, maybe discussed the communities further. need to get together to uh, start looking at those, you know, some other reasonable options so that, because uh, this lawsuit seems to be something that is going to have a negative impact on, on both residents and businesses. So be nice to uh, figure this out. It will have an it. impact on residents and businesses. It does not seem as though it will have any impact on the lake. Okay. And so somebody finding a different answer for the lake issue Great. would be a good okay. idea. Well, well, thank you, Brian, for uh, joining me today. Uh, I'm Tom Snell, and again, thank you for watching Your Business Matters. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. You've been watching Your Business Matters. For more information on this program or the White Bear Area Chamber, visit whitebearchamber.com or call 651-429-8593.